So tonight, the last night of the mission, and for the topic, I came up with the Holy Spirit and Mary. The Holy Spirit is often not someone we associate with the message of the divine mercy, and in one fact, I make a pitch for prayers on your behalf because I have to write a whole doctorate on the Holy Spirit and divine mercy in the next few years. But I want to bring up the Holy Spirit because he's the one who helps us, as Paul says, in our weakness. And sometimes even after we've heard all about the need to trust in the Father and we've seen all that Jesus does to show us that the Father is worthy of our trust, what do we do? We go up to the upper room like the apostles, we hide, we lock the door, (laughs) and we go back to our normal lives. We don't want to deal with this. And the Holy Spirit is precisely the one who casts out all fear. He's the one who casts out all that is opposite, all that opposes that trust in God's goodness. And so it's important for us to have a healthy devotion to the Holy Spirit in order to trust in the Father, because he's precisely the one who makes us sons and daughters of God. Paul repeats that many a time, that it's precisely in the Holy Spirit that we have access to God to call him Abba, that we can call him someone who is very dear to us, not just a God who requires reverence and, you know, and honor, but a God who wants to be near us. And a modern-day example of someone who had that Holy Spirit and called God such a name was precisely Thérèse of Lisieux. In French, when she spoke of God, she called him Papa. She simply called him Papa. And that was how intimate her relationship with God was, and that's what we see in her writings precisely. She was one who knew how close the Father wanted to be, and that's what I brought up on the first day, No? that Jesus wants to be in our arms. He wants us to feel the warmth of his very body, the warmth of his love. And the Holy Spirit is the one who often bridges that gap, that distance between us and God. He is the one who transforms God from merely a nice idea to a reality. Because that's really what goes on here. And that's why the Holy Spirit is so necessary, because we can hear beautiful sermons. We can hear beautiful missions on trust, but it can still remain an idea and not a reality. And if you look at the Gospels and how the apostles could spend three years with Jesus, hear him day in and day out, and if there's one comment the the Gospels keep repeating, it's what? They didn't get it. (laughs) And imagine after three years, like I mentioned, what do they do? First, they go back to their regular life. I mean, I love Peter. What does he do? He's just seen Jesus crucified, risen from the dead. So what is his conclusion? Let's go fishing. (laughs) Just seen the most spectacular thing in all of human history. And what's your reaction? Ah, let's go spend some time on the lake. (laughs) And the point is, he just wants to go back to normal life. After all that, he just wants to return to what's familiar to him, and he doesn't quite want to enter into the fray of what all this is now about. (laughs) Because for all of us, it can be kind of scary to let the Lord into our lives. It can be kind of scary to let the Holy Spirit in and blow where he wills. Because we can't any longer just go home and have our nice, quiet lives. And not even, per se, sinful lives, but our nice, quaint little lives that we can control and that aren't too problematic. And imagine what that must have been like for Peter. I mean, here's a rather tough and gruff man fisherman, probably a pretty good businessman. He seemed to be the boss, you know, because James and uh, John and Andrew all worked for him. And he's now got to go preach about Jesus all throughout the world, and eventually he's going to be crucified. And you can see, you know, this man, he doesn't like the idea of crucifixion. I mean, every time one priest, he brought this up in a homily, he said, if you look at the Gospels, every time crucifixion comes up with Peter, He denies it, he hates it, he runs from it. Peter just doesn't like the topic. And yet, at the end of his life, what does he do? He's crucified upside down, witnessing to Jesus Christ. 
And it's not just about Peter, you know, the fact that, well, Peter just had a strong enough moral will to, to tough it up and, and get that strong and finally be crucified. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit who's able to transform sinners into saints, who's able to let that word of God that we hear bear fruit. Because what does Jesus say about the seed? He sows the seed everywhere in the hearts of all men and women. But each of us have different soils, and each of us have different yields. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes that soil apt for the seed to grow. He's the one who helps us to understand that word so that it goes from being ideas, words, concepts, to reality. He's the one who makes it just a concept about God, a concept about trust, to that living reality of trust. And I want to go time and again back to that idea of Pentecost, that they spent nine days praying, fasting. Some of you might know, I mean, that's where we get novenas from, because it was nine days from the ascension of Jesus to Pentecost. So that's the first in the original novena. But we, in our spiritual lives, we time and again need to go back to that upper cenacle. And we need to know that it's okay sometimes to be afraid. It's okay sometimes to be discouraged. It's okay sometimes to be flustered and not to know exactly what to do. I'm not saying that we should be all those things. But that when we recognize that we are that way and that despite our best attempts to trust and we kind of fall flat on our face... What's our goal? What do we do in those moments? We recoup. We go back into the heart of the church. We go to Mary, and we pray. We fast. And in that way, we can rebuild that trust. And as we pray, as we fast, our hearts become more and more opened to that Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of sonship, a spirit of adoption, who gives us that confidence to call God Father and gives us that confidence to go out like Jesus did, to have a mission like Jesus did. But I want to emphasize here how necessary it is if we want to live this trust to pray and to pray daily. Because it's one thing to know that I need to trust, but it's another thing to actually trust because it's only by God's grace that we can actually trust. It's not just an obligation. It's a gift I mean, to be able to trust in God, I think I mentioned a few days ago, it relieves a lot of anxiety. I mean, knowing, for instance, that you have a God, an omnipotent God who cares for you by name, that lets go of a lot of stress as compared to living in a world where everything is just fate, everything just happens. We don't know why. There's no real goal here. No one really cares for you. Well, that creates tension, anxiety. And so, in order to trust We need to be fed every day on the Word of God, not just sometimes. And it can be simply the Mass readings. But we need that Word of God because it's that Word of God that the Holy Spirit is going to incarnate in us, and that's where Mary comes in. The incarnation is not just something that's 2,000 years ago and that's it. But each and every day, the Father speaks forth His Word. Maestro Eckhart speaks about this. In prayer, the Father speaks forth his word, and then the Holy Spirit gives that word flesh anew in our very bodies. But we must, we must allow that word to come. And so you don't need to read, let's say, you know, a book of the Bible a day, but a chapter. Read a chapter, or read even just a paragraph, and bring it to prayer, meditate on it. Because a lot of times, as good and pious Catholics we are, Oftentimes, what do we think of when we pray? The rosary, the chaplet, novenas, or some other vocal prayer, which is all good, but it's the beginning stages of prayer. And I don't say that to belittle it. I I pray the rosary daily and the chaplet and other vocal prayers. But John of the Cross, whose feast day is today, Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, other spiritual doctors of the church, they point out vocal prayer is the beginning People who are beginning to learn to talk, just like children, what do children do? They just imitate other people. 
They can't quite form their own sentences fully yet. They just repeat what they hear. But precisely the point of learning a language is not just so that I parrot what other people say, but that I myself might at some point learn to speak myself. And so when we pray, rosaries are good. But the goal is to be able to be with the Lord one-on-one so that what I read about in Scripture becomes real to me. And Ignatius of Loyola proposes a very good method here for meditation. He says, basically, you should put yourself on the scene. So, let's take, you know, the paralytic, one of my favorite scenes from the Gospel. On days where I might not be doing too well, I'm the paralytic. I'm there before the Lord, basically saying, help. But I put myself there, right before the Lord. I'm the paralytic. I need other people. And I can choose those people, you know, people that I know, friends or family. Go before the Lord. Or other days where I'm doing better, I imagine myself as one of the people helping the other paralytic. But each day, to choose a way to get to know the Lord as a living reality. And sometimes when people talk about this imaginative prayer, you know, they kind of think it's like make-believe. You know, just imagination, you're just imagining things. But God can use that, can't he? I mean, if we look at Michelangelo's pieces of art, where did that come from? His imagination. So the imagination can produce very good things. It's not just kind of make-believe. And especially in prayer, the Holy Spirit can use that imagination, how? To get us to know that face of Jesus. So that the gospel comes alive in my own life. And then what? I begin to be able to decipher my life in the light of Jesus. And that's one of the key things about the Holy Spirit when it comes to trust. Because what often happens if things begin to happen in our lives that we don't quite understand, oftentimes as sinful human beings, what's our first reaction? We begin to blame God. We get upset, we get angry. How can he do this? But when we begin to read the scriptures, we begin to see if this is how God has acted all through history, and if this is what God does, I can begin to see the wisdom behind what he allows, what he gives in my life. And so even something as simple as reading the passion accounts, to be able to read them and to see if I'm a baptized Christian and I've been baptized into Jesus Christ, as Paul says, into his death, into his resurrection, and I guess this is just as a very practical example, you know, how many of you are criticized, judged, condemned, How many of you have been mocked? How many of you have been made fun of publicly? How many of you have been given heavy crosses to bury with no one to help? How many people expose you to public shame? A lot of us have been through that, no? And our first reaction is, that's unfair. (laughs) And to a degree, it certainly is. But if we begin to see in our lives that's not just random, it's not just, oh, that happened, that, why'd that happen? But I begin to put two and two together. That If I'm baptized into Jesus Christ, what's happening? Jesus in me is reliving his passion. That it's not just me being mocked or being made fun of or being crowned with thorns. Jesus is the one in me who's going through that again. And so in Hebrew... This is a very important concept to keep in mind about why the scriptures are so important for trust. In Hebrew, the word for word is davar. Now, that refers first and foremost to the word of God that we have written down on the pages of the Bible. But in Hebrew, davar also means event. And the Hebrews understood that the word of God is not just what's written down on the page. Every event in our lives is a word of God spoken to us. And the question is, how do I decipher it? What is God trying to say? Because one event could be interpreted in a gazillion ways. And that's why we have the word of God, so that we can begin to see our lives fitting into the pages of the Bible. And we can begin to see, okay, this is what's going on. And this is how I can trust in the Lord in spite of all these trials, all these difficulties. And this is the path to salvation. And so that's one of the key reasons why we read the Bible, 
It's called the canon. In Greek, the word canon means basically a, a ruler, a measuring stick. You know? How do we measure our lives? How do we measure if it's going well? How do we measure if it's pleasing to God? The Bible, as interpreted, of course, by the church. But the Bible, by the Word of God, that's what's the norm. That's the measuring stick of my life. And what happens a lot of times, if we don't have that, we get confused about where we're going, what we're doing, if we're doing right, if we're doing wrong. And it's that kind of confusion that makes it very hard to trust in God. Why? Because we're kind of off the map. You know, we floated off somewhere into space and we can't quite pinpoint where we are. But when we begin to read the Word of God, we begin to recognize, oh, I'm right here, and the Lord is with me. And we recognize, my brothers and sisters in the faith, they've been through the same They've gone through this before. And we need this word of God because we need to be taught and nourished each and every day. The Jews believed that precisely when they read the Torah, the Holy Spirit would fill them. Now, they didn't believe in the Holy Spirit the same way we did, but they still believed that God had a spirit that he would breathe forth on people. And so it's no coincidence that when does Pentecost happen? When does the Holy Spirit descend? As there praying. And what do Jews do when they pray, even in synagogues today? They read the scrolls of the Old Testament. And if in our own lives we want to have that Pentecost, we want to be able to shift from being afraid, from knowing what we should do, but not quite yet being ready to do it, to being bold and confident, we need to pray. We need to gather together in prayer, not just alone, but in our families. And that's something else I really want to emphasize. The early church, where did they meet? In homes. There weren't yet churches like this. So where was the Eucharist celebrated? At people's homes. And even to this day, the word in Latin for altar is mensa, table. That was the original altar. Why? Because they would gather in homes. And as families... We need to gather as a church. That's how the Pentecost happens. And I say this because, unfortunately, I find all too often in Catholic families, it's the wife who's very devoted, or one person is devoted, and the other person, eh, kind of off to the side. But it's only when all the apostles, on all the disciples, and Mary are gathered in prayer that the Spirit can come forth. Why? Because part of trust is precisely that we can't do it alone. We recognize that I can't do it without God. That's part of trust. You know, not trusting in myself, knowing that I can't do it all alone. But how does that concretely display itself in my life? I can't do it without other people. Because people who would say, you know, well, I trust in God. I know I can't do it on my own, but I don't need anyone else. Ooh. That's dangerous. Why? Because... God concretely makes us dependent upon others in the church so that our dependence on him would be expressed concretely in each other. And so we need, as Catholics, to regain a sense of reading the word of God. And one exorcist, he was saying, you know, how, how can you keep you know, demons away from your homes and your families? Because they certainly want to attack each one of us. Keep a Bible open in your house. Put it in the living room and read from it. Read, read from it as a family, because the demons flee from the Word of God. They hate the Word of God. Why? Because as we read it, that Holy Spirit comes, and he pushes everything else out. And that fear that we have at times, that discouragement we have at times, that can be from the devil too sometimes. It's not just that we have emotions of fear, not just that, you know, I'm kind of worried about this or that. But the devil has a vested interest to prevent us from being confident in God. Because why? If I'm not confident in who I am as a son or a daughter of God, if I'm not confident that the Holy Spirit dwells in me and that his power rests upon me, am I going to go change the world? No. I'm going to do like Peter. Let's go fishing. Why? Because that's all I'm good for. I just I want to go live my little life. Now imagine if Mother Teresa had that attitude. Or John Paul II. The world would be completely different right now. And yet it's precisely because they were able to say yes, and they countered the devil in their lives. 
And I emphasize this not to scare people, but because Satan is real, and he does attack us. And what happened in the Garden of Eden happens each and every day to us. Because it's the devil who whispers into your ear those little thoughts of, oh, look what God did. Oh, look, he took this away. Oh, look, he loves you, and then he sends you this big cross. And just as Jesus sows the words of eternal life in our souls, so the devil also sows those seeds. Isn't that what Jesus says? That there's that wheat field, and then at night, the devil comes. And in the midst of the wheat, he sows the weeds. We need to constantly allow the Holy Spirit to uproot those weeds from our hearts and our souls. We need that time of prayer, and we need to do it together in prayer. Because if that Holy Spirit is near, he's going to fill us with confidence. And we're not going to give in to those lies of the enemy. Because he, I can tell you, he doesn't shut up. (laughs) The devil's always talking. He's always trying to get us to disbelieve. And so what's one of the greatest difficulties when it comes to prayer? Silence. Now, when it comes to prayer, we need to discuss our concerns with the Lord. We need to bring up our daily concerns. But what do we need? We need to be like Elijah. What happened with him? Now, so he's having a great public ministry. And I do that somewhat sarca- say that somewhat sarcastically. You know, he had to kill 450 prophets of Baal. <laughs> And he has to flee from it for his life because the king's after him. And he goes to Mount Horeb, and God tells him, Go and pray, for I will reveal my glory to you. And so there's that famous story. The earthquake comes, but God was not in the earthquake. The winds howl, but God was not in the wind. Fire came, God was not in the fire. And then a still, soft whisper came. And Elijah hid his face because he recognized that the Lord was passing by. The power of God is not a power that's to make itself felt. That's what's very important. The Holy Spirit, he created the whole world. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent. But precisely because he's omnipotent, he doesn't have to make a show of it. Because what does the devil do? Precisely because he's not that powerful, he puts on a big show. Because he wants to make us afraid. But the Holy Spirit, because he's so gentle, he's so calm, he's so peaceful, we oftentimes can let him slip right by and we don't even notice. We don't even notice the power that's within us. Why? Because it's a peaceful, gentle love. And that's one thing I can't remember, some Russian author, maybe Dostoevsky, in a dialogue in one of his books, he's commenting, we have to decide once for all against all forms of violence. Now, most of us here aren't about to go commit an act of murder or anything, but we have to decide against the power that uses force. And we have to decide for the power that is called love. That's what can change the world. Why? Because it's this man who's changed the world for 2,000 years. Some of us know about Augustus Caesar. Do most of us know all the details of his life? No, he's a nice history character. That's it. Napoleon, he had a nice empire for a short period of time, and it went away. But all these people go back into history. Why? Because their power, it comes... And it goes. And as great as it seems to be, it's really nothing. But what is the power of the Holy Spirit? It's the power of love, the power of being able to sacrifice like that. Because that love is unstoppable. You know, one of my favorite stories about Mother Teresa, she was in Lebanon in the middle of one of the wars. And the general met with her because she wanted to go into the war zone. And the general is basically saying, there's no way... You're going over there. And of course, typical Mother Teresa, oh, I'm going. (laughs) The war will be over tomorrow, and I'm going. So of course, this little nun puts herself to prayer. Sure enough, the next day, ceasefire and peace. And she's able to go over. 
That's why I say, sometimes we think, you know, the people who have power in the world, you know, presidents and kings and all that. Who has the real power in the world? You and I. If we learn to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us to that cross. Because Jesus himself didn't just decide one day, oh, I, I want to go die on the cross to show how much I love. It's the Holy Spirit who's leading Jesus. And it's the Holy Spirit who's giving Jesus that confidence in the Father that, yes, I can take this path. And one of the things I want to say is that if we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, where is he going to blow? Where is he going to lead us? To Calvary. That's going to be hard. But if we allow that Holy Spirit to enter our hearts at each moment, then we too can suffer like Jesus. We too can have that kind of confidence that Jesus had. And we, like Jesus, will be able to change the world. Not because we try to do a lot, You know, Mother Teresa didn't have to make a bunch of noise to do everything. She just did it. And when we are people of prayer, we're people filled with this Holy Spirit, what happens? We, too, can speak the word, and it changes reality. Because at the beginning of the whole Bible, what happens? The Father speaks the word, and because that word has the power of the Holy Spirit, it creates It was by the word that all things were made, John said. And it's that word that carries forth, that, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, that word that breathes forth the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to go back again and again to modern-day saints, John Paul II, a man of prayer. There are many stories about how many rosaries he would say when he was at St. Louis, apparently. He was up at 4 a.m. in the morning, and he didn't move for two hours. He was on his knees right before the tabernacle. And one of the American bishops kind of corrected him, saying, you know, Your Holiness, you need to rest. He said, Your Excellency, you need to pray. (laughs) Typical John Paul II response. (laughs) Jeevish, his secretary, would go looking for him in the morning, nowhere to be found until he found that he was lying prostrate on the ground all night. Some of us may know what happened in Warsaw in 1979, in Independence Square. There, he was allowed to enter Poland, communist Poland, much to the communist chagrin, of course. And there, on the eve of Pentecost, so at the Vigil Mass, he's preaching. And at the very end, he prays the prayer we always pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. So he said that, but then at the very end, what did he say? Calm down and renew the face, Tejemi, this earth. Ten years later, what happened? Communism fell. No war, no intense bloodshed, and then the whole Soviet bloc, one after one after one. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of someone who's able to speak that word of God, and he doesn't have to fight for it. He doesn't have to use weapons, but he speaks. And the scriptures, interestingly, when they describe Jesus, especially in the book of Revelation, fighting against evil, it's very interesting. The word uses the sword of his tongue to defeat his foes. Why? Because Jesus confounds his enemies by that Holy Spirit that he speaks. And it confounds them. Not because he destroys them, he just murders them, but precisely because evil falls apart of its own. We have only to be witnesses to the truth. We have only, like Jesus, to speak the truth in love. With that power of the Holy Spirit, we can change things. Even if that's not necessarily our goal, we will change the world if we simply Pray, if we live our vocation as Christians, if we're truly filled with that Holy Spirit. But this is all connected to trust. Why? Because we have to trust in the Lord and His power. Can we do these things of our own? Absolutely not. And oftentimes, what do we read about in the Bible? You know, Mary's the only one, the only one, who ever said yes. All the others, I love Moses in the Old Testament. There's two whole chapters dedicated to his call in Exodus. Why? Because God says, I'm choosing you. 
now go lead my people out. And Moses, no, no, no. <laughs> we got the wrong guy. <laughs> so God gives him one sign. No, I'm not quite sure. Another sign. No, I don't think so. Another sign. I don't speak that well. <laughs> and so God finds it. Fine, get Aaron. Now go. <laughs> And if you read the book of Judges, the same. When the judges are chosen by the angel, you know, do this sign. Make sure this is really it. Mary's the only one who simply said yes. She had one question, and the question wasn't a doubt to kind of wiggle her way out. It was to confirm that it was truly the Lord, and then she simply says, let it be done to me according to your word. Now that's true humility, because a lot of times, what do people do? They have this idea of false humility, like, oh, I, would never, I couldn't become a saint. I'm just, you know, Jane Smith. I, I'm just so-and-so. I can't become a saint. Imagine if Mary said that to the angel. Oh, I'm just this little girl from Nazareth. The whole mother of God thing, I don't think so. <laughs> Go find someone better. No, that's not humility. Humility is not thinking we know a better plan than God does. Humility is precisely saying, no, I'm not equipped for this, and I never will be, but he's equipped. And the Holy Spirit, what does Gabriel say? The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And what happened to Mary at Annunciation happens to all of us at Pentecost, and where is Pentecost renewed in the church? At Confirmation. Those who have been confirmed, that grace of Pentecost has already been given to you. And so when you pray, what I would invite you to think about is to ask the Holy Spirit to renew baptism, the grace that you are given to be a son or a daughter of God, and to renew the grace of confirmation of Pentecost. Because a lot of us Christians, we live only our baptism. Baptism is directed towards our personal union with God and union in the church, but our, the primary benefit of ba- baptism is for me. What's the goal of confirmation? Now that I've grown, now that I've been able to be, be filled with Jesus Christ, now to go out and to witness to him before the world. And that's what Pope Francis keeps hitting upon over and over. If our Catholic Church is just to remain inside the Catholic Church, that's a problem. That's not how the world became Catholic. <laughs> Imagine if the apostles were like, oh, okay, it's nice. <laughs> Let's just stick to our little areas. No, they went out, and they faced all sorts of dangers. And so one of the effects of reading the Word of God each and every day is you're going to know how to evangelize, because a lot of people wonder, you know, how do I evangelize? (laughs) It's not a strategy. You know, it's not, as Francis complains, but it's not proselytism, where you have like a program, and you give them a spiel, (laughs) and then you try to convince them to reel them in. No, what is evangelization? It's sharing that word of God. It's showing people that Jesus Christ is alive today and showing them that you too can experience the joy of believing in Jesus Christ. And they're only going to believe that if they see that in your eyes. They're not going to believe it if it's simply, yeah, you're a Catholic, you believe these things, and I believe these things, so why should I believe yours? What are they convinced by? They're convinced by a saint. There are very few arguments against saints. When people meet a saint, they know it, and they tend to believe what that person said. Why? Because that person gained their trust, not just because of what they said, but because of their character. Now, isn't that why people love John Paul II? Not just because he was a great teacher and all these other things, but the man was a saint. That's why people listen to him. And why could he preach to so many people? Because he read that word, and he shared it freely because it meant so much to him. And so, Our prayer life is important not just for ourselves, but, again, going to this idea of Pentecost. They're reading the Word of God. They're meditating on the Word of God. And what does Peter do as a direct result of Pentecost? He goes out and he preaches. Now, that seems kind of neat to us most of the time, but remember, this is the guy only a few chapters ago who ran for his life, who denied Jesus three times, and hides, and he wants to go fishing again. And now he's proclaiming the word of God. It's not just the very event of Pentecost. It's that he spent that time in prayer. He spent that time being filled with the Holy Spirit who's given him that confidence, that power, 
so then he can go out. And what was the fruit of his preaching? Three thousand in one day. Now, it's not just because Peter was Peter and, you know, the head of the church. That can be any of us. If, like the apostles, if, like the disciples, we gather around Mary, we gather in the church to pray, to meditate, to allow the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts and our lives. Now, the other part that they did there, and this is very essential, is they fasted. Now, not all of us necessarily can fast for a whole day, depending upon our health and our conditions. But as I talked about in the homily this morning, we all need to do some form of penance each and every day. I mean, if only because of what Mary said at Fatima. Souls fall like snowflakes into hell because there's no one to offer sacrifice for them. I mean, to think, I think it's something like 200,000 people die a day. It's a lot of people. Not all of them are even Christian, majority not Christian. And to think these people are approaching their Creator and they haven't heard about Jesus Christ. And we have the opportunity through daily penance to offer something up for them, for people we don't even know, that we might only meet when we die, and someone will greet us at the gates of heaven saying, thank you for what you've done. I remember my spiritual father, he loves coffee, and he loves sugar in his coffee. (laughs) I remember about 10 years ago when I first got to meet him, I kind of gawked one time when I saw him in the morning, spoon, spoon, spoon. You want a little bit of uh, coffee with that sugar? (laughs) And the Lord one time asked him to give up sugar and coffee. And he thought to himself, like, big deal. I mean, it's not that much. And he didn't really give in to it. And that night he had a dream. And he saw a mountain of sugar. And he asked, what's this? He said, that's all the sugar you'd give up if you gave it up for the rest of your life. And he said, And that's how many souls you might save if you did that. It doesn't need to be something huge. It doesn't need to be something that we're just going to feel pain. Because it's not pain that brings salvation. It's love. Now, love expresses itself oftentimes through sacrifice. That's why the cross is the centerpiece of our faith. Not because we worship pain, but because we worship the one who loved me and you so much that he embraced that much pain. And so part of the confidence that we need as Christians is that we're not pushovers. And I don't say that to be demeaning. But we're people who know how to experience pain. And we're not afraid of pain. We're not afraid of the cross. Because what's the message of Christianity, as Bishop Barron said so beautifully at World Youth Day? I recommend his YouTube video. You can find it on there about the cross at World Youth Day. He said, we hold up that cross as a taunt to say, look, this is what the the worst the world can do. This is all it can do to us, and we're not afraid. You can crucify us, we're not afraid. You can kill us, we're not afraid. Why? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says, and I said that the other day. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. What's the only thing that can separate us? My own sin. Not hunger, not pain, not nakedness, not persecution, not the sword, not wars. Only my own sin. And so as Christians, what's the goal of doing daily penance? To open up our hearts to that power of the Holy Spirit that we say, I want a greater share of the love of God, not a greater share of the goods of this world. Because capitalism has got us hooked. My professor for morality in seminary had a very astute observation The devil learns. He's not omniscient, so he learns. So in communism and all the other persecutions, he's kind of learned, okay, if you persecute Christians, it backfires. So let's not just try to kill them off. So what does he do in the U.S.? There could be persecution coming, but so far, say the persecution is perfect. Why? Because you just get people to see well, you know, religion is just one part of your life. It's not the most important part. You need to work. You need all these other things. And just make religion less and less important. It's just one thing among many. And get people hooked on all the good things they can have in this life. All the money, all the pleasure, all the joys that pass. And so why does penance need to be recovered to say, oh no, I'm not going to fall asleep and get drunk on the things of this world. 
No, I'm, I'm in this only for the Lord. And they can take whatever they want, but not take Jesus. They can take my friends, my family, they can take everything, but not Jesus. And this is something that we need today if we think about the news about our brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq. You know, they're very moving stories of kids. They say goodbye to their parents. They don't know if they're going to see them that night. Friends who haven't seen each other, and they don't even know if they're alive. Children who've been beheaded. Teenagers who've been crucified. Why? Because witnessing to Jesus Christ is very real. It's not just a nice talk that I'm giving. Because what's the goal of the Holy Spirit? To bring us to that cross. And even if we don't die a bloody death, the strength of our love needs to be that strong. That we'd be willing to do that. And penance is saying, I want to prepare myself. I mean, what do athletes do? I used to swim. I was on the swim team for Strake Jesuit. I would wake up at 4.30, I'd swim for an hour and a half before school, go to Mass, go to school, then I'd go back in two more hours of swimming in the, in the afternoon. And i repeat it all over. I need to do that. Why? Because when it's time to perform, I need all of that under my belt. And sometimes we only get one time to perform. And our brothers and sisters, they don't get multiple tries when the question comes, are you Christian? They only get one time. They only get one time to witness. You know, there's a story that came on the news some months ago of a Christian in Syria who, when one of the ISIS fighters broke in, asked, are you a Christian? He said, yes. He said, and before you, I'm paraphrasing, before you kill me, I want you to read this. And he handed him the Bible. He said, this is for you. And this is the true God. The ISIS still killed the Syrian. But that soldier read the Bible and he converted. That death of that Christian bore fruit. Because he was filled with that spirit. He was ready to give that testimony. And we as Christians, we need to be willing to give our lives to give spiritual life to others. Tertullian, a church father, he said, the seed of Christians is the blood of the martyrs. Isn't that what we celebrate at the Eucharist? The blood of Christ is the seed of all Christians. So it brings life to all of us. But penance is like that daily practice that trains our spiritual muscles so that when the time is ready, we're able to go out. When the world threatens us, we don't cower. When the world wants to manipulate us and say, oh, we're going to take this away, or this is going to change, or about this, and we say, oh, I'm not going to give in. Because it's very easy to give in. It's very easy to cave in and say, I want to preserve my little life, and I want it to be comfortable and easy. Because that's what capitalism sometimes can do. And I'm not against capitalism, by the way. I'm not here to rip it apart. But I'm just saying, and it, it can have these effects where it can make us asleep, like Peter, James, and John in the agony. It can lull us into sleep. And that's how the devil will win in the world, is if Christians are wooed by the world. And so in the book of Revelation, what does the angel say? It tells the Christians to get out of Babylon, to remove their lives from the world of the world. And the reward is truly beyond this world. Because what does the world want to say? You're only truly going to be happy if you have all this, if all this goes well. And those who have tasted the power, the sweetness of the Holy Spirit know there's no delight greater than the presence of the Holy Spirit in the soul. John of the Cross, whom we celebrate today, he, towards the end of his works, he said, when the soul tastes union with God, true union with God, Even for one second, and this is clear that he experienced this. He doesn't say it, but it's clear that he's writing about his own experience. Soul experiences union with God for one second. It completely forgets about all the evils it's endured and realizes that everything was worth it. Now, it's hard for us to imagine, no? Because we're more used to all the mosquitoes biting, all the cuts, all the little daily pains. and We gripe and complain, and we can't see how this is all worth it. But that's why we have the saints who have reached it and who have basically told us, oh, it's worth it. You know, it's like people who've been to Hawaii who tell us, oh, it's beautiful, you want to go there. (laughs) 
You want to pay the price? And John on the cross, the other saints tell us, it's worth it. Why? Because that Holy Spirit, when we truly allow him to bring us into union with the Father, and he truly fills our souls, it's beyond our wildest imaginations. And in prayer, we can begin to experience that even now, and that's why I want to keep going back to prayer. Because it's impossible to truly trust God the Father if we don't yet experience his love concretely here and now. If God's love is just an idea, we're not going to die for an idea. If God is just another part of my life but isn't my very life, we're not going to be that confident when troubles come. But if the Holy Spirit is able to give us that ability to look at God, to see his goodness, to help us to taste his goodness. And that's what the Psalms say. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. You know, the Jews understood this in the Old Testament. They too had these mystical experiences. And that's not just for the saints, that's for you and for me. Because that's the Holy Spirit we have by baptism. John of the cross has no advantage over us. Why? Because he had the same sacraments we do. He has the same Holy Spirit we do. He has the same Eucharist we do. What's the difference? He surrendered. He prayed. It went from being an idea to being a reality. And why could he give up so much? Because he could taste it already. You know, it's like an appetizer. <laughs> you taste a little bit and you want more. And what does God do? In prayer, he gives us the strength already, knowing that, okay, we're going to have more difficulties ahead. But now that we've already tasted it, we go, okay, <laughs> I can hold on to this. But if I don't pray... When the troubles come, I'm not going to remember that. And I won't even have that to look back to. And I'm going to say, oh, no way, I'm not giving this up. <laughs> and so if you look, for instance, at even Jesus' life, what's the sequence? Tabor, Calvary, resurrection. Even Jesus needed that sweetness of being in union with the Father that final time there on Tabor to descend one last time and then go to his crucifixion. We all need those Tabor moments. We all need those moments of Pentecost where the glory of God is revealed. And, and in the Bible, the glory of God is not just some presence and not just an idea. It is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the glory of God. He's the one who shines forth in the brilliance of Tabor. He is that light that shines forth. That's given to us in prayer if we take the time, if we dedicate our time. But we need to be generous, and John of the Cross brings us up. We can't have prayer just like a little part of our life, or we kind of squeeze prayer into our life. Prayer needs to be the center of our life, and around that orbits everything else in my life. That doesn't mean we need to pray for hours a day. It simply means that the center of my life is the Lord, and everything else revolves around that. Because what often happens when we begin to pray, we kind of squeeze it in here or there. It's kind of like an extra thing in our day. And the real conversion happens when prayer is my day, and my day turns into prayer. Even when I'm not sitting down to pray, I'm talking with the Lord, I'm conversing with Him. And those penances help me. Why? Because they remind me that what I see, what I feel, what I hear, what I taste, it's not everything. So if you fast, you know, that grumbling stomach... <laughs> Instead of just fulfilling that stomach by just giving it food, say, Lord, I delay eating that food to say, I want you. You're the fulfillment of my body and my soul. You bring me true joy. And that can be done with a number of things. It can be done with TV. It can be done with other kinds of food. It can be done with our favorite hobbies where we set it aside for a little bit. But the goal is to... Allow the Holy Spirit to occupy that center of our hearts. And that gives us confidence. Why? Because as I'm able, for instance, to deny myself in food, and I recognize, I can do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can do this. That's what I was talking about earlier. Then when the trial comes, I don't fall. When the trial comes, I'm confident. When the trial comes, I know that the power of God is with me. Now, St. Paul, when he talks about the power of God, dunamis, dynamite, that's where we get our English word dynamite from, this explosive power, 
That's the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, created the whole world, and that's the power in you and me. And penance is about kind of getting off that outer crust of our hearts, the hardness of our hearts, so that that power can truly be explosive. I keep going back to this because it's so important. Faustina changed the world. She didn't preach. She didn't work outside her convent. She could barely read and write. She had only two winters of education. And yet look at the change she's produced in the world because that Holy Spirit was released through her sufferings and through her pain. And that's one other point I want to bring. uh, St. Peter, in his letter, he says, the Holy Spirit descends upon you when? When you are mocked and insulted for the sake of Christ. That's when he says, the Spirit comes to rest on you in all his glory. And so, very concretely, what I would encourage you is when you feel like you begin to kind of drown in the midst of difficulties. When your trust begins to wane, call upon the Holy Spirit. One Franciscan friar, he has a series on the Holy Spirit on the internet, and he said what he'll do sometimes with his rosary ring is instead of praying the ten Hail Marys, he'll just say, come Holy Spirit, ten times. And I would recommend that. When you hit up against something that's unexpected, that's hard, or you're doing some penance and and you really want to eat that ice cream? (laughs) Come, Holy Spirit. Call upon that Holy Spirit. Allow that power of God to be released in your heart and your mind and claim it. Don't just kind of ask and say, well, that didn't work. (laughs) Call upon the Holy Spirit and have the faith. He comes. He responds. His power is present. And Solanus Casey, he would recommend whenever you ask something of God, give thanks because you've already received it. Give thanks, because God has heard your prayer and will answer it. And so, when crosses come, see those as moments when the Holy Spirit wants to descend upon you. When that fire, as I talked about yesterday, when does the fire truly burn away all that water, all of our sin? It's there on the cross. The cross is the place, all of our trials, that's when the Holy Spirit is poured upon us. That's the Pentecost. Because John, in his gospel... When does Jesus give us the Holy Spirit? He first does it when when he dies. He says, and then Jesus handed over his Spirit. Because it was all through that suffering, all through that trial, that then at his death, he hands over that Spirit upon all of us. And that's what happened with that Syrian Christian, who at the moment of death was able to bring conversion and new life to that Muslim. And that's each of us. Now, I've spoken much about Pentecost, I've spoken about prayer and about fasting, but I want to give two concrete examples of that Holy Spirit in the Bible. I know I don't have too much time. I tell people I won't be like Paul. One of my favorite stories about Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, he preached so long that a boy who was sitting on the windowsill fell asleep and he fell out the window and he died. Thank goodness that Paul had miraculous powers because he raised the boy from the dead. I can't imagine that conversation with him and the mother. (laughs) Mary. This is a woman from Nazareth. Do we know much about her life? Not much. What do we know? She probably read the scriptures because she was able to understand some of what was going on. She was able to be faithful to Christ. And as Lou points out twice, she held all these things and meditated on them in her heart. Mary was a woman of prayer. And she was a woman of penance. And we see that if by nothing else, by the fact she was very poor. When she brought Jesus to the temple, all she could offer with Joseph was a pair of two turtle doves. Nazareth in Jesus' time was a very poor area, and they lived in caves. They didn't even have that many trees there, so they would just live in caves. A very poor woman. And she's the mother of God. How? Because she said yes. And because she allowed that Holy Spirit to overshadow her, and because she was a woman of prayer, of penance, she wasn't attached to the things of this world. Then, as I point out the other night, What happens at Calvary? 
She's able, by that same Holy Spirit, not to give in to the normal human emotions a mother would have. I mean, what, what would a mother ordinarily feel looking at her own child dying right in front of her? Anger? Sadness? Fear? Rebellion? And what does Mary do? She's quiet. Now, it's clear from what Luke writes, Mary didn't all have this figured out in her head. You know, when Jesus is found at the temple, I love his response. I mean, imagine losing your kid for three days, and then the boy says, oh, why, why are you wondering where I was? Because <laughs> you're my child. <laughs> but Luke says she didn't understand. But she held all these things and pondered on them in her heart. Mary pondered those things from Gabriel, all that he had promised, that Christ would reign as king, that he would be the successor to David. And yet, at that moment, when everything seemed false, It was by the Holy Spirit that she was able to let go of all of what she would want, that her own son would live, and that this, you know, it wouldn't be a terrible death like this. She could let go of all that, and she could trust in the Father. Now, that trust is not humanly possible. That's only by the Holy Spirit. And that's only because she let go. And there's a beautiful scene there in the Passion of the Christ. When Christ is raised up on the cross, she digs her hands into the ground. She holds on to the dirt. And then as she looks at Jesus, she lets go. God's plans are going to confound us. God's promises even are going to seem not to be true in our lives. It's going to seem like what we believe as Catholics is contradicted by the words of God, the events of God in our daily lives. But we need to be like Mary. We need to be a disciple. The word disciple means one who is taught. We need to be willing to be taught like Mary. We need to be able at each moment to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, even in the midst of complete darkness, and to teach us to trust in the Father. Because humanly, what are we ready to do? We're ready to give up at those moments. We're ready to throw in the white towel and call it quits. And that's what the apostles did. They fled in fear. Peter, out of the goodness of his heart, what does he do? He tries the path of rebellion and anger and violence. What's the, what's the way to deal with such situations? Trust. Trust. But it takes a life of prayer, and that's what I was pointing out, that all this prayer, all this penance, it's what's necessary so that we can be at Calvary. We can't get there without this day in and day out prayer and penance and calling the Holy Spirit into our daily lives. Because this isn't just all of a sudden Mary was able to do this. It's the build-up. Because she's prayed, because she's meditated, because she's heard her son preach, and she's taken it to prayer. She probably remembered that her son said that he would rise in three days. She might not have understood what that meant, because no Jew at that time understood what a personal resurrection meant. For them, resurrection was everyone together at the end of time. But Mary believed, and she stuck there with Jesus. And that's what the church needs in you and me. The church needs people like John who are going to be there to hide under Mary, people who are going to have that Holy Spirit that she had to be faithful, to be loyal, and like Elijah, who listened to that still, small whisper, to be able to be at Calvary and not give in to all the din, the mockery, the noise, the taunts, But like Mary, to listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit that says, trust, wait, patience. Patience is a hallmark of trust. And patience is a hallmark of the Holy Spirit. Catherine of Siena, in her dialogues, the Father said, how do you know you have charity in your heart? If you have humility and patience as well. Because the three always go together. But you can't have one without the other. And obedience, too, I should say. Humility, patience, and obedience. They're all sisters. And we see that in Mary. She was obedient. She didn't try to get her own plan accomplished that evening or that day. She trusted. She waited. She was humble. And we know what happened on the third day in the resurrection. And then Peter. Here's this man who, like I said, goes from being a fisherman to being the Pope. 
And imagine that kind of life. <laughs> but I want to bring one very important scene. It's not the crucifixion, but a similar scene. And that's the walking on water. Peter is someone who, even though he often makes mistakes, he's got the chutzpah, he's got the courage to try things, to put his foot out, to do things, even if they're really not going to succeed. And I bring that up because Teresa of Avila, she complained, too many Christians, we crawl on the path to holiness. And she said, I'd rather someone who sprints, who falls over and over, but at least they're going. Peter, he got up in the midst of that storm, and he began to walk towards the Lord. What is trust? It's leaving that little boat of our security precisely in the storm. I mean, what do people people typically want to do in the middle of a storm? You'd want to be in the boat. (laughs) But that's purposeful, because what do we do when the storm hits? We go to our little security blankets, you know, Linus and Peanuts. (laughs) We all have our security blankets. And the Lord tells us what? Hand that over. (laughs) Get out of the boat. Come and walk on the water. Now, who else walked or hovered over the water? The Holy Spirit. At the beginning of time, the Holy Spirit hovered over the water. And the Holy Spirit is active in our lives we can walk on water. Now, don't go to a pool and try this. <laughs> I was a lifeguard, <laughs> so spare my fellow lifeguards having to jump in after you. <laughs> but things that are impossible, you're going to do. Miracles, they're going to happen. But you have to believe it. You have to, like Peter, be willing to get out of your comfort zones and to obey the Lord when he tells you to do seemingly even stupid things. I mean, from a logical perspective, a man telling another man, hey, get out of a boat in the midst of a storm and walk on water. I mean, if it weren't for the Lord Jesus in that story, anyone would say, that's crazy. But it's precisely that kind of craziness sometimes that's needed for the Lord to work his miracles in our lives. And it's that kind of craziness that's the fruit of trust. And I'm not saying to do stupid things in the literal sense, but we need that kind of trust that Peter had. That willingness to say, you know, I'm not perfect. And he even drowned eventually. But we need, like Peter, to say, but I'm going to try. Because what most of us do, we're we're already decided, I'm going to drown. I'm safe here. I'm not moving. (laughs) But we need to get out. We need to try. Much like children. I mean, how often do children stumble and fall? Constantly. And what do they typically do? Get back up and keep going. As Christians, we need that trust in God to hear him tell us sometimes odd things, crazy things, giving up this, giving up that, going out on a limb over here. But we need to do it. And someone once asked me last night, what's the relationship between trust and obedience? Trust is the attitude of the heart that expresses itself in the concrete action that is obedience. The two go together. How do you know that someone actually trusts in God? They're obedient to God. That's why St. Faustine in her diary, what does Jesus make her do towards the beginning? Two pages. On the first page, write, my will no longer exists from this day forward. He said, and cross it out. And on the next page, the will of God. From now on, I do the will of God always, everywhere, and everything. That's what it means to trust. Did Faustina do some crazy things sometimes? For her own convent, yes. <laughs> and she even kind of got into some trouble, as it were, miscon- uh, miscommunication. But she tried. And because she tried, we're here. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. When those apostles and disciples gathered in Pentecost, they weren't perfect. And even after the Holy Spirit gave them that boldness, They still weren't perfect, but they went out and they began. And that would be my goal for you at the end of this mission. Yes, you need to gather in prayer. Yes, as a church, you need to pray, you need to fast, you need to do penance, you need to gather together. 
But if it ends there, it's going to die. Because we need to go out, and we're still going to be imperfect. We're still not going to trust in the Lord. We're still going to be like Peter, trying to walk on that water. And this time we might make five steps, and then we drown. The next time, seven steps, and we drown. But what's our assurance? Jesus is always there to bring us out of that water. That it doesn't upset Jesus that we fall. It upsets Jesus when we don't trust. I want to make that clear. What makes Jesus upset is not when his children fall, it's when his children don't even try, when they don't even trust in him enough to obey and to walk out on a limb. And that's what I would encourage you. None of us are going to be perfect. But call upon the Holy Spirit. I I tell my own spiritual directees and friends, morning and evening, choose your favorite prayer, but pray it every day, morning and evening, to the Holy Spirit. Every day, read a chapter from the Gospels or the New Testament. Every day, find some penance. And do all this in the context. Beg the Holy Spirit to fill your lives, to give you that confidence, because that's what trust means in Latin. There's no word trust in Latin. It's confidencia, confidence. How is the world going to recognize that we're Christians? Our confidence in our Father. Like I mentioned yesterday with that boy in the school. We need to be like that boy. We need to be so filled with the Holy Spirit, we go out and we proclaim with confidence that word of God. We're ready to preach. We're ready to walk on that water. And we will have all the saints by our side. We have the whole communion of the saints with us. Peter, Mary, all the apostles. Call upon them. They respond. They will walk with you. And one day, you'll be with them. That's my prayer that after all this mission is over, all of us here and more who should be filling these seats, they'll all be in that heavenly kingdom, worshiping and praising God the Father for his goodness and for his love. Amen.